morning, Gateway. Welcome. Now, you hear us say that all the time. And so when we say good morning, Gateway, here's who we're including. All of you who have been here so long, and we just can't get rid of you, um, you to the very to you that maybe walked in for the very first time today or you, you're online for the very, very first time. Everyone in between, your gateway. So welcome and thank you for being a part. My name's Tom and uh, <clears throat> I hang out in the lobby afterwards. I love the lobby and probably with kids. So we've not yet met. Want to want to uh, make an introduction. So thank you. Have the joy of serving on, on the team here. How many people here enjoy camping? Few, just a few? Okay, how many like you, it, your camping thing, it's the tent thing, because if you're not in a tent, you're not camping. Okay, so that's some of you, right? How many like camping for you is, is like the mosquitoes that's hiking? And these guys like right down here, um, <laughs> Mario and, and Joe, they just did a 40 mile hike, right? Got eaten up by mosquitoes. That's camping, right? Um, how many of you have... have um, you progress from a tent and sleeping on the ground in a sleeping bag um, to something like a tent trailer. Now that's camping. Oh, not too many, really. I mean, I remember as a kid waking up in a tent in water, right? So maybe you've done that too. How many like the trailer thing? Okay, now how many like the 40-foot motorhome thing? No, okay, no. So, I mean, I know what happens, right? So, Jen and I, we kind of stepped up to a small little trailer that we have, and we, so we, we enjoy camping um, qu quite a lot. We've done a lot of camping in our lives with our two boys as well. It's always fun uh, to, to get out. But from time to time, um, we select like to go to like a, a Airbnb or something like a cabin, and Jen will, yeah, so that's camping, right? Yeah, so no. <laughs> yeah, the five-star motel or whatever. I know who you people are, right? Okay. Um, so um, Jen will go like, okay, so where do you want to go? And I go like, I don't, I don't care, but just can you get us on a river? Because I love rivers, you know, and that's, that's my thing. So um, in fact, if I could choose, right, to be on a cabin in, in a river, it would probably look something like this right here, right? That's my, that's, that to me is camping right there, right? Come on. <laughs> Yeah, I'll rent it to you someday, okay? No. Um, <clears throat> but, so honey, some, some place on a river, and my, my wife is a master at this, I don't know. She finds these places and she finds these cabins on a river, and, and they're just absolutely incredible. And so we stay there, and it's beautiful. I selected our destination one time. And, uh, and uh, um, here's how it went. I had distant friends who became the brand new owners of a fishing resort in Washington State. If you ask me what the resort is, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to out them, right? But they became the brand new owners, and so they sent out a letter um, to a bunch of us, happened to be pastors at the time, and they said, look, here's what we're offering, and we're just brand new owners. And it, it, it looked beautiful. And so I scheduled a, a week of vacation for Jen and me and our two boys that were younger at the same time. Now, particularly during that time, I would just tell you this, that like resources weren't a lot. So this one week of vacation was our one week of, of, of vacation. And so they described it this way. It's this beautiful cabin sitting on this beautiful fishing lake. And I know that the, the fish were large. And the cabin that we're going to give you is the best one in the group. And there's a lawn that goes right down to the lake. So I shared this with my wife. I shared this with my two boys. So this is going to be an incredible week. And we're going to be in this cabin on this lake. And guess what? It has this lawn that goes right down to the lake. I can't wait. I talked with my younger son last week. And I said, do you remember when we went to this Resort. He goes, Dad, I remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> and I have in my mind this vivid image of mom sitting on the bed with tears rolling down her eyes. <laughs> I will tell you these were not tears of joy. <laughs> when we arrived at this cabin, um, there was uh, cardboard on the broken window, right? So you really couldn't see out that. It, it wasn't the cleanest cabin around. 
and the, the lawn going down to the river. Have you ever heard someone describe a home that you want to go look, look at as having waterfront, and when you get there, it's a leaking septic tank? Okay, now, 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 now you get the picture. My wife was a Christian before we got there, and she was mostly a Christian after we got there, but, you know, she, uh, she, uh, um, she recovered from that, and we, we, we spent the week there, and we had a great time, and we certainly have memories of the time. It was also the last time I was ever allowed to select the cabin that we go, we go to, but here's the deal. Um, it was not like I had envisioned it. It wasn't like I was told. It wasn't like I envisioned it. And we've learned in life that this is how sometimes life is, right? We want this. We want the beautiful cabin on the river, you know, with the hot tub overlooking the, the water. We want that, but what we get is this over here. We may plan for this, but when we arrive, it isn't anything like we thought it was going to be. And that describes life for some of us even, even this morning because life has its ups and downs and it's filled with twists and turns and sometimes head fakes. I mean, we can be heading in one direction like this and all of a sudden something happens, right? The phone rings, you get a call, you get a friend, something happens in life and all of a sudden you're heading the other direction. Some may remember I shared this story years and years ago. Um, I had my forerunner and so I had to run home for a little bit and I, I drove up our driveway and I jumped out of the car and ran in, had to tell Jen something. And when I went out there, my car was gone. The problem is there's nobody in the car. And I ran out to the driveway to look and just see it rolling down the driveway all by itself. Um, I ran down there. I actually got in front of it to try to stop it from running into the neighbor's garage. That didn't succeed. It hit the neighbor's garage, dented up my, my forerunner. I, it had no collision insurance because of the age of the, of the car. And the insurance company is telling me, like, it's not, you know, sorry, it's collision. I said, how can it be collision? I wasn't with the vehicle, you know? <laughs> so, but that argument didn't work. And all of a sudden, this, this day that I had all planned out, this started off really, really good. All of a sudden, it just wasn't doing so good. Now, compared to what some of you are walking through, you go like, that's just metal. And you're right. Because for some of you, life offered a twist and turn or a head fake to you this past week. And you're not real sure how you're going to make it. I won't talk about that today because life is fun, it's messy, it's complex, it's busy, it's broken, it's exhausting, it's exhilarating, it's seasonal, meaning there are ups and downs, but in all of life, and this is a really good place, even if you're not an amen or in church, in all of life we have learned that God is good, faithful, and worthy of worship. Amen. amen. Unchanging, loving, and he guides each step. So in this series, we're examining um, the Psalms, real life and the real God. That is that right in the middle of life, wherever you are today, whatever it is that you might be facing, the good times, the bad times, the challenging times, right in the middle of all of life, we find God. The Psalms are love, someone said, because they, they deal with all the ups and downs of life. And if you were to ask me what's your favorite psalm, here's what I would tell you. It will be different today than it will be tomorrow. Have you noticed that? Because it just seems like, and my Bible reading takes me to the psalms each day, that the psalm for that day seems to fit the circumstance that I am in right now. The psalms are love because they deal with all of life, the whole of life. If we're facing challenges, the psalms deal with those. If we're facing loss, the psalms deal with those. If we're in that place where we're lifting up the name of, of, of God from, from a heart filled with joy, we find ourselves in the Psalms. The Psalms don't shield us from the realities of life, do they? It's interesting because David, um, in Psalm chapter 9, just the opening verse, he writes this, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. But flip the page, just go one chapter over, and David says this, Why, O Lord, 
do you stand so far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? I mean, can you relate to that? Now, like in one moment, you're going like, yay, God. And the next moment, you're going, where, God? Right? That, and that's, that, that's life. Psalm 25, verse 16. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all of my sins. Now, in the corner of the slide, there's a QR code. And you can download all the notes for today that we're, we're walking through. I can't imagine the psalmist, just kind of think about it for just a moment, kind of walking into our lobby here, right? And so we know he's a psalmist, right? Because he has a badge that says, I'm the psalmist. And so you know that. And uh, we go like, hey, how's it going? I can't imagine uh, that he would respond, great, regardless of what he was going through. But we're kind of conditioned to do that, aren't we? Like, we could come in, it's been the worst week, and someone will go, hey, how's it going? You're going like, it's going, it's going great, and it's really, really not. That's why we talk about doing life together, because we need one another. Life is done in circles, where we can pray for one another and support one another, and remind one another that right in the middle of life, God, God is. So fill in these blanks right now. Life, ready? Life is, what are you going to put there? You don't have to say anything or tell anybody, even write it down, but life is... And then God is. Life is, God is. The reality is in just this moment, like a lot of us, it was really easy to fill in life because you're in that place. Maybe And maybe a really, really good place. It's it's the best it's ever been. It's challenging. It's hard. And maybe not so easy. Maybe a little bit slower. Filling in the last part, God is, because you're like David in Psalm 10. God, where are you? Like you feel so far away. I want to talk about that this morning as we consider probably the most well-known psalm. And if I were to ask you what it is and shout it out, um, you would probably say the 23rd Psalm. But here's what we're going to find. If you're in that place today, in that Psalm 10, you're in really good company. Because if we were to tell all of our stories, you would find that there are people just like you. And together, we're going to a God who never changes. And this is what we see in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The 23rd Psalm is read on so many different occasions, including celebrations during times of grief, and it should be. It's beautiful. I mean, you can draw a picture, you can imagine a picture of what the psalmist is describing, right? It's almost like that beautiful cabin on a lake, right? And you think this is the way that life is going to be. The Lord is my shepherd. I'll never want. I walk through green pastures and we get this beautiful imagery. But we read the 23rd Psalm and we often leave out this one line or we kind of pass over it. And I want to camp on it in just a little bit. And that one line is this. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. We'll come back to that in just a moment. I'm suggesting today that we look at this very well-known psalm, the 23rd Psalm, through uh, three, three phrases that I believe lead our, our thinking as we consider God's guiding hand in, in all of life. Number one, we see a place of provision. We talk about that. Number two, a place of a presence. And number three, a place of purpose. So everyone say provision. Provision, we'll see that. Presence and purpose. I think the key to understanding the 23rd Psalm um, is really found in these words, for his name's sake. For his name's sake. Or as the NLT version would say, bringing honor to to his name. 
Think about it again. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want for his namesake. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters for his namesake. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of, of, of death, I will fear no evil for his name's sake. For his name's sake, for the glory and for the honor of his name. God has you where you are today. In green pastures, still waters, experiencing spiritual refreshing, his comforts and his presence for his name's sake. I want you to th just think about that for just a moment. He has you in that place to bring glory to his name. He also has you in a place that you might not choose, are you ready, for his name's sake. Talk about that. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy his name forever. That's living out God's purposes in our life. Let me simply say it this way. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is for his name. He provides for you for his name's sake. He's always present in our life for his name's sake. It's about living a life of, of thanksgiving. Two key thoughts as we kind of dive into a few things. David writes from experience as a shepherd king. So he's not writing about things he read about. He was this. So he's associating real life to where he was. And so he writes the 23rd Psalm. It was a common metaphor in ancient Near East. But for David, right, it was a natural thing because he was a shepherd king. The rod and staff that we read about were essential to the shepherd's work, right? This, this sturdy wooden stick provided protection, the staff provided the symbol of, of guidance, kind of leading and guiding the sheep. He uses these to remind, remind us of the great shepherd and his care for the flock. Now, this is you and me. Philip Keller, years ago, wrote a book called A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm, and he writes this. In a sense, the staff, more than any other item of his personal equipment, identifies his shepherd as a shepherd. No one in any other profession carries a shepherd's staff. It is uniquely an instrument used for the care and management of sheep, and only for sheep. It will not do for cattle, horses, or hogs. It is designed, shaped, and adapted especially to the needs of the sheep. The rod and staff represent the care for the sheep and the action of the shepherd in daily care. So what we're seeing is not only the representation of care, but the action of care by, by the shepherd. That should not be lost on us. And so let's talk about a place of, of, of provision for just a moment. David declares that the Lord, as shepherd, provides all that's needed. Now, let me say this. Sometimes our wants are not what we need. <laughs> uh, if you have kids, do you give your kids everything they want? Mm -mm. You give them what they need, sometimes what they want, right? So I think we miss Matthew 6, 33, right? Um, that if we, if we just honor the Lord, right, that he's going to provide everything that we need. No, 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 no. That's not what he says. Our, our will begins to align with his will for our life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. What are all these things? We like to name them. There are wants. But what happens when we begin to align ourselves with God is all of our needs become what his needs are for you and for me. And David says um, that he will provide everything that we want or that we, that we need. And the shepherd knows. That's the good thing. He knows what you have need of. And sometimes we find our, our, our place in life going like, God, don't you even know? I can't make the rent. I can't buy the groceries. You don't even know where I am. Yes, he does. The Bible declares that. It's a place of provision. He will provide all that we need. I don't know how he does it all the time. But he does. He's the great shepherd. There's a place of, of presence. David speaks as a shepherd who, is, who assures us that regardless of where our journey takes us, we are not alone. I have friends, you have friends, who have experienced um, um, huge loss in their life. But during this time, 
They have sensed and known God's presence, the great shepherd, during life's darkest moments and challenges, which David describes here as a valley of the shadow of death. Our great shepherd is present. Life is God is our provider. Life is God is present right in the middle of life. Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Psalm 31, 3, for you are my rock and my fortress. And here it is again, for your namesake, you lead me and you guide me. But what about the part that, that, that we might leave out? I mentioned it to you. It's the fifth verse of the 23rd Psalm. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I don't want to eat with my enemies. <laughs> I, I don't want to sit at that table where life seems to be very, very challenging. The very thing that challenged me and Maybe they're people, maybe they're not. I, I don't want to be there. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies? I, I don't want to be in that place where my trust is tested, where I'm not humanly sure how this is all going to turn out, but that's a table that I'm sitting at. I, I want to sit at the table of my own choosing. I want to sit at a table where I know what the next step is. I want to sit at a table that I'm in complete control of. I don't want to be at that table. A table represents the place I sit at, I live at, I reside at, I do life at. And it's okay if I choose it. But what about when I can't? What about when I don't? You see, sometimes we pray to get out of the place that Jesus has placed us into for his namesake. Some of you, he has placed in your workplace, in your cubicle, amongst people that you would never choose to do life with, that challenge your faith each and every day, and you're praying, God, get me out of this place. But he has placed you there for his namesake. He has called you to a place of trust. It may not be the place that you choose, but he has set that table for you for his namesake, and he invites you to sit at that table. But God, I don't want to. This is really hard for me to trust you when I can't see what's going on. He has placed you among people who aren't too kind, and they're at work, and they're your neighbors. They challenge your faith, yet Jesus has set that table for you for his name's sake. It's living out our purpose in life. We've experienced his provision. We've experienced his presence. And now he calls us into purpose. He has called you to a task, and everything in you wants to say, no, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to sit at that table, God. But he's placed you there and he's calling you there for his name's sake, for the glory of his name. He is placing you where you can live out your purpose and providing all that you need to carry out his purpose in life for his name's sake. So instead of praying, Jesus, get me out of this place. Jesus, take me away from this table. How about if we pray this, God, provide for me. Let me sense and know your presence in this place for your name's sake, for the glory of your name. Three questions that we can ask today, and it's really a lens, I think, to look at, look at the Psalms. Number one, what do we learn about God, his character, and his ways? What do we learn? What do we learn about life? We've described life already. It has its ups and downs. And what do we learn about living? What do, we, what do we learn about God from the 23rd Psalm? His character and his ways. What do, we, what do we learn? Well, he loves us and he's active in our life. So you, you can fill in the blank this way. Life is whatever it is that you're facing. And God is loving and God is active in my life. Even if I don't feel it, even if I'm at Psalms 10, I'm saying, God, where are you? 
we're assured based on the scripture that he is with us and he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. Psalm 121 verses one through four, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. So what do we learn about God? He's active and he's present. Even during the Psalm 10 times, what do we learn about life? Well, you filled in the blank, didn't you? Life is broken, it's messy, and it's challenging. And sometimes you're walking through the valley, but it's in the valley that we look up and we see God. We learn about his character, we learn about life. But what do we learn about living or my response to life? Well, from the 23rd Psalm, the good shepherd is with us all of life. And my response is to trust him in all of life for his name's sake. So I'm going to pray. And I want to invite some of you to take some steps because I got two steps. Number one, I choose to place my trust in Jesus. Some of you perhaps never have. You're online. You're checking things out. Maybe you're here. You've never taken that next step, which is your first step and into a relationship with him. I'm going to pray in just a few moments. And I've said it so many times before, there aren't any magic words that if you screw up the order, you know, the salvation prayer doesn't work. It just comes from your heart and say, God, like, I just need you. And I want, to, I want you to walk with me all of my life. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he's just, and he forgives us. Are we perfect people that never make? No, no. But we're saved people. We're saved people. So I'm going to pray that prayer. And then I'm going to pray this prayer, number two. I lean into his purpose for my life. Some of us have been struggling because we're in that valley. We're at that table. We're asking questions like, God, where are you? I'm going to pray that many of us will lean into his purpose for our lives. It might be at your work. It might be at your home. It might be, I had someone after the last service say, I'm, I'm in that place with a neighbor who is cruel. But what if we lean in God's purpose? What if we be the image of God to the neighbor, to your workplace for his namesake? Not for the namesake of Tom or Jeffrey or Mario or you, any, any one of us, for his namesake. Father, and I pray for the one, and if, if this is you, and you want to take that first step, that next step into a relationship with Jesus, just make this your prayer. God, I ask you to come into my life and forgive me and Make me a brand new person. I want to live for you. I've tried it on my own, and now I'm coming to you. And I ask you to forgive me. I make you Lord of my life. I believe in you. I trust in you. If we just pray a simple prayer like that, he makes us a brand new person. He walks with us and he leads us and he guides us and he gives life a brand new meaning with a brand new purpose. He created you for a purpose. There are many of us that are in that place and we're sitting at a table that we would never choose today. Some of us are going through deep grief. Some of us are in a place where we're being called to trust you, God. And we don't want to be at that table. Some of us don't know what tomorrow looks like. And we're sitting at this table. But it's one that you prepared. So we lean into your purpose. God, may everything we do and everything we say bring glory to your name. For the glory and for the honor of your name. For your name's sake. So our prayer is simply, God, use us. May your name be glorified as I walk through these days. Whether they be times of challenge or great days of joy, it's for your namesake, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.